So my name's Chris Absher. I'm one of the campus pastors here at Grace. You saw Chris Pedro, the other campus pastor. Two Chris's, very confusing. I get it. But we're the campus pastors here. And this weekend, we're starting a brand new series called Hurry Up and Wait. And before I kind of jump into introducing the series, I wanna give some appreciation to Pastor Chip because he really gives us so much freedom for us other pastors here on staff about what do we feel led to talk about. There is a ton of pastors at churches that are super micromanaging and wanna control everything and that is just not Pastor Chip's heart at all. He gives us so much freedom to say, what does the Lord laid on your heart and what do you feel like the people of grace kind of need to talk about? And so I just wanna appreciate him for that. Yeah, you can give it up for Pastor Chip. Okay, enough mushy talk about Pastor Chip. We're done with that now. So I wanna start off introducing this series to you called Hurry Up and Wait. All right, is there anybody here who just absolutely loves sitting in waiting rooms? Anybody? You you have like a doctor's appointment at 10 a.m. and you get up and you're like, I just am so excited to get there and to hold that magazine that's been in there for 18 years and thumb through the pages that 10 billion sick people have thumbed through is gonna be so awesome. Nobody likes that. But the reality is, as much as none of us like waiting, we do it all the time. We wait at doctor's offices, we wait at dentists, We wait in line at the grocery store. We wait in line at traffic lights, at amusement parks, at concerts. We wait all the time. And that's not just true of our just day-to-day lives. That's true even also of our spiritual lives, that we wait on stuff all the time. I'm convinced that everybody is waiting on God for something. And I'm convinced of that because of lots of conversations that I've had, and Chris Pedro, we kind of work together to put this series together And in so many conversations we have with so many of you, we realize, man, everybody's waiting on God for something. And maybe you don't think that's true, but at some point in life, we are. Because let me ask some questions. Is there anybody here who's like, I've got a health condition that's been going on in my life for years, and I've been waiting on God for answers. I've been waiting on doctors for answers. I've been waiting on healing. I've been just waiting and I'm waiting on God to show me what should I do, or God, I want you to heal me, and we're just waiting. Or maybe somebody's here this weekend, and you've got a prodigal son or daughter, and you have prayed every day, God, would you just intervene in this? Show me what to say and what not to say. Touch the heart of my son or daughter. And you're just waiting on the Lord to intervene. Or maybe there's something in your marriage, and we're like, God, things are not what I want them to be, but everything I do, it just feels like a hairball, and I don't know what to do and what not to do. God, will you just lead and direct my steps for me to know what to do? Or maybe you have a job opening that's come up, and you're like, I don't know what to do. If I take this job, I'm gonna have to move my family 400 miles, and schools are gonna be different, and relationships will be different. And God, I'm just waiting on you to help me know what door Do I walk through, do I stay here, do I go? I'm convinced after so many conversations that everybody's waiting on God for something. And the reality is that waiting is really, really hard and none of us like to wait. Remember when you're at the grocery store, it's like the day before Thanksgiving and the other register opens? Everybody, beeline for it. We don't like to wait. And we don't like to wait in our spiritual lives either. So what do we do? And that's the question that this series is trying to answer. What do we do when we're waiting on God to help move us from where we are to where we wanna be? All of us are waiting on that in some way about something in our lives. What do we do in the meantime? And so what I wanna do this weekend to start the series is look at some passages all about King David. Now pause Everybody pause, look right here. Please don't tune out because you've heard 10,000 messages about King David. I've heard 10,000 messages about King David too. Just hang in here with me. We're gonna look at some stories from King David's life that maybe you're not as familiar with. We're gonna immerse ourselves in the story, looking at how did King David wait on the Lord and what did he do? And then we're gonna look at a Psalm that King David wrote during the time of waiting and see it's almost like his diary. What was he thinking? How was he talking to God? What was he expecting during this time of waiting? And once we've done those two things, looked at the stories in the Psalm, we'll ask the question, what are we supposed to do when we're waiting on God? What can we learn from these stories? And so to get us started, 
we know in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that David gets anointed king. But he's not gonna become king yet. We know that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David. He anointed him king and he did it in the midst of his brothers. Does anybody have younger siblings? I need you to imagine what this would be like. Somebody from the US government comes to your house and says, line up all the siblings. And they walk and they say, you're not the one, you're not the one, you're not the one. They come to your youngest sibling and they say, you are gonna be the next president of the United States of America. Can you imagine what? They snore in their sleep. They chew with their mouth open. They're annoying. There's no way they're the one. And that's how David's brothers felt about him. They're jealous, they're angry, and you see that unfold, but he's anointed in the midst of his brothers. There's no denying, there's witnesses. David is the king. He's anointed to be the king of Israel. And when that happens, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. All the stories we're about to talk about, the spirit of the Lord is on David. It rushed on him from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and he went to Ramah. Now, if I'm writing the rest of 1 Samuel, David gets anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. If I'm writing the story, because I don't like to wait, and none of us like to wait, I'd say, let's just write it where David becomes king in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Done, end of story. That's how it should work, right? But that's not at all how it works. David doesn't just wait days, weeks, months, years, David has to wait 15-ish years between the time he's anointed king and the time he actually becomes the king. Can you imagine a guy, you're say 15 years old, that's probably when David was anointed. You give up all your teen years and all of your 20s waiting on God to do what God said he would do. That's David. Talk about a guy who's like, God, where are you? What's going on here? I've been waiting all this time. And again, if I were to write the story of how David waits, I'd just say, okay, everything in the timeline's gonna be nice and peachy keen and everything will be great. But in the middle of David's waiting, he goes out of the frying pan and into the fire over and over and over and over again. So just to give you an overview before we get into our main text. First, we learn that David fights Goliath. You know the story. He says, you come to me with sword and shield. I come to you in the name of of Yahweh, the God of Israel. How dare you defy Yahweh's armies? And David kills him, cuts off his head. Everybody's happy, except for one guy, whose name is Saul, right? Because even though David did the thing everybody else was scared to do, and he should be the hero, that only lasts for about two seconds. And then you have Saul, who's jealous. David's not a hero. It turns out Saul twice attempts to assassinate David. Can you imagine being a teenager and Saul, the king of a country with an army and a military is after you, it'd be like if you were on the run from the Navy SEALs. Do you think you would make it? Of course you wouldn't, unless God had said something to you. You would never make it. But David, twice Saul attempts to assassinate him, throws a spear at him, tries to pin him to the wall, sends men to his room in the palace at night to stab him in his sleep. The only reason David even got away on the second time is because his wife, who is Saul's daughter, talk about family drama here. You think you got family drama, they really got some family drama. Tells David, this is about to happen, you gotta get out of here, man, and David escapes. Okay, surely that's enough drama. Surely that's enough suffering in the waiting, but there's more. Saul attempts to assassinate him, and then another king nearly kills David. You learn about Achish, the king of Gath, and David, who's been out killing Philistines and doing all this stuff, is in the court of this wicked king, and they say, isn't this, isn't this David? Isn't this the guy who's been like killing all our, our guys and taking out our armies? We should kill him. And then David, remember, the Lord's anointed, the one who is, it was said of him, you are going to be the king. David finds himself foaming at the mouth and scratching on doorposts, you can read it, acting insane just to survive with his life. Okay, surely that's gonna be enough, but of course not, there's more. After that, 3,000 men from Saul, Saul's army, trap David in a cave. 3,000 guys, it's like it just gets worse for this guy. It's awful, it's terrible. 3,000 men trap him in a cave, but that's not enough. 
Saul's army, after he escapes that, we'll come back to the story of the 3,000 in a second. After he escapes, Saul's army corners him again. The Navy SEALs are after this guy. He's not gonna make it. They, they're after him. His army chases David again and he escapes. But once he's escapes, you know what he learns? His two wives have been captured. It's like, come on, man. What is going on? Why is this so hard? And in the midst of his wives being captured, all the wives and children of his men were captured too. So you know what the, his own men do? David's men consider killing him. Why don't we just stone this guy? He's getting us into all kinds of trouble. So he's had a king after him, another king, armies. Now his own men turn on him. So if you look at the timeline, these are just some excerpts of what David has gone through. In 15 years of waiting for God to do what God said he would do. God, you said I'd be the king. When's that gonna happen? Doesn't seem very likely from what I've been going through. But what I wanna do is look at a particular story on this timeline. The 3,000 men trapped David in a cave. We're gonna look really closely at this story. And what I want you to do is kind of be imaginative with me. I want you to imagine you're smelling what David smells, you're hearing what David's he hearing, you're fearful like David's fearful. Let's immerse ourselves in this text because I think that's what we're supposed to do when we read scriptures, really feel the story. And once we look at it, we're gonna read the Psalm that David wrote during this time in his life and then see what would that have to say for us. So we learn in 1 Samuel 24 that when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, behold, David, the guy you wanna kill, is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel. And I just imagine the scene with me for a second. Saul summons the Marines, and he's like, you look like a David killer. You look like somebody who could take David in a fight. You look like somebody who could cut off his head. You're the best of the best, and I want you to go after one guy named David. And just to put in perspective, 3,000 men, that'd be like if we filled this auditorium three times, Saul handpicked that many people to go after one guy named David. The Marines are after you. You're not going to make it. It's tough. It's hard. Out of all the men of Israel, and they went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats' rocks. They know David's hiding out there somewhere. And then we learn that he, Saul, came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. It's just hilarious. The guys go into the bathroom and that's where this whole story unfolds. Saul thinks he's safe. He's got his 3,000 guys. Y'all just chill over there. I'm gonna use the bathroom here and then we'll go get David. Has no idea that the very cave he stepped into is where David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Now, I need you to imagine, why does the text tell us that David was in the innermost parts of the cave? It's because David's running for his life. You gotta imagine, the cave maybe gets narrower and more narrow and more narrow towards the back, and David has shoved himself up in a crevice with, what's crazy about this is, it's the Lord's anointed who finds himself smeared with dirt and just junk, hiding up in this cave, running for his life. That's why he's in the innermost part of the cave. And here's Saul, totally unaware that David's inside. And the men of David said to him, now I need you to imagine with me for a second, they're in this cave, all holed up together, and there's Saul right there. They wouldn't have just been like, hey David, they would have whispered. They would have been trying to, I don't know what they would have done, but tried to do it very quietly. Here's the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I'll give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. In other words, the men are like, David, Saul's right there. The guy who's ruined your life, the guy who's ruined our lives, who's made us run, who's made us fear for our lives every day, he's right there, just take him out. Just forget all this waiting on God stuff. Just take Saul out and you'll be king. David doesn't do exactly what they say, but David arose and he stealthily cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Doesn't kill Saul, but this would have been sending a message in the ancient Near East because when one king conquered another king, 
they'd always cut off part of the robe of the conquered king and sew it onto their own robe. It was a way, the longer your robe, the more kings you've conquered. That's why when the prophets talk about the train of the Lord's robe filled the temple, it means God is king over everything. He's beaten everybody. So for David to step up and cut off a corner of Saul's robe, that's sending a message, man, I win. Checkmate, I had you in the palm of my hand. See, right? that's what that message would have been. And then we learn that David said to his men, he immediately felt bad for what he had done. He said, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. Saul, the Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. Believe it or not, David still recognizes Saul was anointed to be king. And God will make me king one day, but while Saul's king, he's the Lord's anointed. You talk about sort of turning the other cheek and not taking things into your own hand and just trusting God to figure it out. It's exactly what David does. I shouldn't have even touched him. I shouldn't have done that. But of course, David's men, they really still wanna kill Saul. David has to talk them down. David persuaded his men with these words, and he did not permit them to attack Saul. Can you imagine being David in this moment? Everybody wants to kill Saul. Saul's the reason they're in the innermost parts of the cave. Saul's the reason they've been on the run. David says, you can't kill Saul. Yeah, I know he's right there. I know we could take him, but you can't kill him. He's the Lord's anointed. David had the chance to get out from under the waiting to just take it in his own hands, and he doesn't. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way, totally unaware that he was this close to the man he's been trying to kill, and that very man had his life in the palm of his hand. Crazy story, but there's a little more to the story. We learn that once Saul walks out of the cave, that David also arose, and crazy David went out of the cave. There's 3,000 David killers out there, handpicked by Saul to take his life. David, what are you doing? But he gets up and he walks out of the cave. And after all this whispering he's done with his men, he called after Saul, my Lord, the king. Can you imagine David saying that to Saul who treated him so terribly? He says, my Lord, the king. In other words, I'm your servant. I'm not after you, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, this is just crazy. David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. He's still the Lord's anointed. And that David does that after all Saul has done for him. Talk about turning the other cheek. That's what David does. Bows down, he pays homage. And then he says, see my father? See the corner of your robe in my hand? He's got it right here. See this that I've got? For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and I didn't kill you, because I had you right here, man. I Checkmate. I had you. You can see that. I got the robe right here. By the fact that I didn't kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong. There's no treason in my hands. I haven't sin sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. So I'm not your enemy. You want to like maybe call off the manhunt? I'm not the guy who's after you. And then we learn that as soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? Can you imagine the audacity of Saul after all he's done to be like, my son David, is that you? Remember, David actually is Saul's son. Family drama, they're working it out. He is Saul's son. He said, is that you? Is that your voice? Probably because David looked nothing like he used to look. He's been in the wilderness running around. Probably looks crazy. Maybe his voice doesn't sound the same anymore because he hasn't had water in days. We don't know. But Saul says, is that you, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Why did he weep? The next verses tell us why he wept. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. Saul's all of a sudden realizing I'm the bad guy in the story. I'm the king of Israel, but I'm the bad guy in the story. I've treated David unrighteously, and he's been treating me righteously. And then we learn, Saul says these words, now behold, I know that you shall surely be king. Can you imagine for David what it was like 
that the very guy who's been trying to kill him and take his life openly admits, David, I know I've been after you. I know I've got all the resources. I know I handpicked 3,000 guys, but since God said you would be king, you're gonna be the king. It doesn't matter what happens. I couldn't stop it if I tried, and I've tried. You shall surely be the king. Can you imagine what it was like for David to hear those words after all this time? Oh yeah, I've been anointed. God said it, it's gonna come to pass. I'm gonna be the king. And then Saul says, I also know the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. You're gonna get it, man. God said it, it's going to come to pass. And in the middle of this story, David writes Psalm chapter 13. And we don't know exactly when in the story David wrote Psalm 13. We just know he was on the run from Saul when he wrote it. But for the sake of just feeling the emotion of this psalm, I want you to imagine with me David in the innermost parts of the cave, holed up in a crevice with dirt and mud and junk and a bunch of guys that are sweaty and gross, and he's holed up in there hiding for his life. The anointed king is smeared with dirt and grime running for his life. So just imagine that's the time where he's writing Psalm chapter 13, and David's really honest, and I'm gonna try to read it in the way I think David maybe would have said it. So here's what Psalm 13 says. How long, O Lord? It's been a lot of years. How long is this gonna go on? Will you forget me forever? Maybe you feel that way. God, where are you at in this mess? You said I'd be the king, and I've been running for my life ever since. Where are you? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I'm so far back up in this cave, I don't even know if you can see me back here. How long are you gonna hide your face from me? Where are you at? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long can I not even walk out in the open without being spotted and chased down and killed? How long is this gonna go on, God? Where are you? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long is Saul gonna sit on his throne eating grapes and having a great time and I'm holed up in this cave and he's not even righteous, he's unrighteous. How long is this gonna go on? And then David says, consider and answer me. And he says some really important words here. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God in the middle of all of this, even in the middle of saying, God, where are you? David never forgot who his Lord was, who his God was, that he was always sure of. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, help me understand, lest I sleep the sleep of death, because without you I will, I'll never make it. Lest my enemies say I've prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. If I go down, they're gonna laugh, They're gonna point to this guy who followed God and say, look where that got him. Don't let that happen to me, God. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Can you imagine David holed up in this cave, looking at the situation, 3,000 David killers, handpicked. All they gotta do is find him, and he's a goner. I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. In other words, God, I don't know how you're gonna work this out. It seems like I'm a goner. Seems like everything is against me. But God, when you do save me, because I know that you will, you said I'd be king, so I'm gonna be the king. When you save me, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. Why will he sing to the Lord? Because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know where in this story God has dealt bountifully with David. He spared his life, he survived, but that seems to be about it. And people can disagree with me on this, and that's okay, but I think David can say this because he is so confident that what God said that he would be king is going to happen that even when it hasn't happened yet, he can look to it and say, I'm gonna be the king. You have dealt bountifully with me. 
The day is gonna come where it's all gonna be set up right. I'm gonna have all the things God said I would have. And so even though I don't see it right now, I know it's gonna come. You have dealt bountifully with me. So having looked at this story of David, one of many, and a song that he wrote in this time, like his diary, what he was feeling and thinking, and I think there's a couple of things that we can take. What does this mean for us? All of us are waiting on God for something. So what do we do when we're waiting on God for that thing? When we're waiting on God to move us from where we are to where we wanna be? Well, we do some of what David did. So there's a couple of things I think we can take from this story. The first one is, it's okay to be honest with God and each other about how we're feeling while we're waiting. It's okay to be honest with God and each other about how we feel when we're waiting. You probably feel it. I know as a Christian, I feel it, and I especially feel it as a pastor. When somebody asks me, how are you? I say, I'm so good, even if I'm not good. Because I, and, and maybe, and then you say, I'm good too, even if that's maybe not true. Because we're scared to be honest with each other about what we're going through. It doesn't, I know that what I feel is, well, if I, if I say anything else, then maybe they won't see me as somebody they can rely on, or maybe I won't be able to be as helpful. Maybe they won't trust me to sort of lean on me anymore. That's hard. And we just have a tendency as Christians to not be honest with how we feel. But David was honest, and the Psalms, go, pick any Psalm, just start reading Psalms. It won't take long before you come across some very honest feelings about the difficulties of life. David was honest. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? Maybe your prayer life sounds like this right now. God, where are you at? I've been waiting, I've been praying, I've been seeking you, and I've got no answers, and I'm still waiting. How long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Where are you, God? David gets more honest. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long am I gonna wake up every morning and just be depressed and anxious and worried? How long, God? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long is it gonna keep seeming like everything in life is just beating me? And I'm just losing and losing and losing. The reality is we believe here at Grace that nobody should do life alone. It's okay to be honest with God. He can take it. He certainly did from David. He can take your honest feelings and my honest feelings, but we also need some people around us. Not everybody, but some people that we can walk this out with. That was an amen, I'm telling you, in dog. <laughs> Second thing I think we can take from this story. The temptation will always be there not to be patient and instead find our own way to hurry up the waiting. The temptation is always gonna be there, whatever we're waiting on, not to be patient, but to find our own way to hurry things along. When the other aisle opens at Publix, we run to it. We're not waiting, we're moving, we're doing stuff. And that temptation is always gonna be there even in our spiritual lives. It was there for David. There's Saul in the cave, and the men of David said to him, there'll be people that tell you, forget about waiting on God. Where's he been at? Don't wait anymore, just take it in your own hands, just do it yourself. That was the temptation of David. They say, here's the day the Lord said to you, there's Saul right there, just take him out. That temptation's gonna be there for us, but it's important that we keep waiting. And here's, here's why it's important. The reason we need to keep waiting is because God is working in the waiting. He is, he's working in the waiting to teach us reliance on him, trust in him, and to shape us to be more like him. You think David would have made a great king at 16 years old? No, God used the waiting to teach David how to lead men in challenging, challenging situations. He used the waiting to teach David to be resourceful. He used the waiting to teach David to rely on God as the only means of salvation. He taught David how to be merciful to his enemies. He needed that prep time to become the king God had called him to be. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. That doesn't minimize the difficulty or the pain of the waiting. I'm not saying that at all. 
But if we really believe that God is working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes, then we trust that God's working in the waiting. He's doing something. Even if we don't see it, if God said it, it will come to pass, just like it did for David. You're gonna be king. Nothing, not, no Saul, no foreign king, no armies, not even your own men can stop you from becoming king because God said it would, it would happen. The third thing I think we can take from this story, and this is the one that I hope will just give us the most encouragement and the most hope. Third, we can take God's promises to the bank. We can take God's promises to the bank. <laughs> because that's exactly what David did. In the middle of all of this, holed up in the crevice of a cave with 3,000 David killers, handpicked to take his life, David could say, I have trusted in your steadfast love. God, I don't know how you're gonna work it out. I don't know how you're gonna do it, but I've trusted in your steadfast love and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. However you save me, however you come through, however you do it, God, when you do, I will rejoice in your salvation. And when it happens, I'll sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I think if we took a poll and said, can you raise your hand and say that you look back on your life and that God has come through, that he's dealt bountifully with you? I think all of us would say, yeah, I've seen it again and again. Even though I didn't understand it in the moment, I've watched it happen. Now, most of us are not waiting on a promise to be anointed king or queen. If you are, see me afterward. I'd be interested to hear that story. Most of us are not waiting on God to be the president of the United States, but everybody's waiting on God for something. Everybody is. And here's why I know that we can take God's promises and his word to the bank. Here's why I know it. Because the fulfillment of every promise we're waiting on is found in Jesus. Every single one. God said he's a good father who wants to give good gifts to his children. God says he would never leave us or forsake us. God said he saved us, that he redeemed us, that he bought us with a price, that we've been adopted as sons and daughters and that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church and he's coming back to make everything right. All of it's in Jesus. All we do is say, yes, Lord. I, I hold on to that promise. And I know that every promise is found in Jesus because first or 2 Corinthians 1 tells us all the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus, all of them. We hold on to what he's done. That's why it's through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Whatever we're waiting on, it might not happen next year, next month, next week. It might not even come to pass in our lifetime, but a day is coming where if God said he'll never leave us or forsake us, he's not gonna leave us or forsake us. If God said he's gonna see us through to the end, he'll see us through to the end. If God wants to give us good gifts, he'll give us good gifts. If the spirit of peace can guard our hearts and minds, then it will because every promise finds its yes and amen in Jesus. All we do is say, that's my champion. That's the one I follow. That's the one I'm about. And so we're gonna sing a final song because I know it's hard to wait. It's hard to be reminded of these things while we're just waiting and things aren't adding up. Where's God in all this? This final song is called Take Courage. It just says, take courage, my heart. Be steadfast, my soul. He is in the waiting. He's in the waiting. So I wanna ask you to just sing this song, have a moment with him. He's working behind the scenes. He's got us. His promises, you can take them to the bank.